good to see everybody out again this cold, cold afternoon. We appreciate it. Appreciate you putting first things first and being here making that effort. <clears throat> I want us to ask and answer the question for our own benefit of uh, if Peter were here today, what would he say to the religious world in general? It occurs to me that he would say what he said at the very beginning. But our religious world has changed dramatic, dramatically, especially in the last several decades. We can notice tremendous changes in religion, and sometimes even in uh, churches of Christ. And some of it is unfortunate. But uh, Peter answers some questions that I think that we need to be able to appreciate. And I think that we can. If you'll open to the letters that Peter wrote, First and Second Peter, you'll observe some things about Peter's document then that has a lot of practical meaning, and I hope that you'll follow very closely. These documents show what he would stand for and what he did stand for. I hear many people through the years, in the last several decades especially, use such disrespectful, and I guess the disrespect is because they don't understand or they've never had the knowledge of the Bible. But the disrespect that I see in people is that they kind of think that the Bible is just kind of just... Just like anybody else's letters, you can take them or leave them. But we know that the scriptures are given by inspiration of God. And Peter understood that. And therefore, we do not in any way undermine the truthfulness of the scriptures. It's... That's one of the foundation stones that has been well established, or should be. But I look at Peter and I see some things that he believed in that uh, are contrary to a lot of modern thinking. And the first thing I'd like you to observe with me is that he believed that there was a body of absolute truth, a body of absolute truth, which he wouldn't say... This is my truth, and you have your truth. But he believed that there was a body of teaching that was true. And it's true no matter whether I accept it or whether anybody else uh, denies it. It is the truth. It is the truth. He will use that term several times. And I'd like you to notice the first time in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Where he says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. And again, I want you to understand that Peter did not believe that this was just optional truth. And that you can make of it what you want. Or anybody can make of it what they want. Or they can manipulate it in any way they would like to. But there's got to be a standard that we all must measure up to. We must measure ourselves by that body of teaching. And if we're wrong, we correct ourselves because that body of teaching is the truth. And we're the ones who are in error. And we have to come to believe and match up with the truth. He says in chapter 1 verse 12... To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who preach the gospel to you. But notice who's behind this gospel by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So the Holy Spirit was there to make sure it wasn't just Peter's truth. And it wasn't just Paul's truth, it was God's truth. 
And so they preach the gospel by the Holy Spirit. This is Holy Spirit. This is sacred truth. It's the things that angels desired to look into. And you'll notice also in chapter 2, or actually 2 Peter chapter uh, 1 verse 12. He says in 2 Peter 1 12, Therefore I will not be negligent to remind you always. So this is not just temporary truth either. This is something you're going to need down the line. That you'll always have these things. That you, I remind you of these things. Always of these things. Though you know them and are established in the present truth. The present truth is the truth. And it is presently with you at this moment. But I'm saying this to you to remind you of it. Because one day down the line, you might get to thinking that it's no longer the truth to you, but it is. It's the absolute truth always. And then in chapter 2 of 2 Peter, verse 2, he says, Many will follow their destructive, talking about false teachers. Many will follow their destructive ways. In other words, their, their ways are not the truth. And that's why they're false prophets. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. People will blaspheme the truth. They'll lump all religion together because it's obvious that a lot of religion is false. And people don't understand that uh, there might be a lot of false religion, but there's still some absolute truth somewhere. That those false teachers have gotten away from. And so you can't just lump all of Christianity by the hypocrisy of some or the, or the false teaching of others. Because everybody has got to line up to this body of truth. The truth. So Peter believed in absolute truth. But another thing. He believed. He believed that the word of God would not die out with time. One of the things I hear people say, I catch people saying, well, you know, that's just a 2,000-year-old document. I mean, it might have been good for its time, but we've moved on since then. Well, you may have moved on too far. We've got to make sure that we're not moving past the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Back in 1 Peter again, look at verse chapter 1, verse 23. After saying, you purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Again, stressing that the truth comes to us through the Spirit. In sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again. Now, how did this born again, how did we become born again? Well, he says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. We were born again through the seed that God planted, and it's God's seed. We're through the word of God, and notice what he says about it, that it's, it doesn't matter if it's 2,000 years old or 5,000 years old or however old it is, it lives, and it abides forever. So it's going to always be the truth, and it's not going to change, because truth does not change. And God's truth that brought about our conversion wasn't something that, um, well, that was true for then. Well, if it was just true temporarily, then it didn't cause us to be born again in any kind of relationship to God. If God is not forever and his word is not forever, then we're not related to the forever God who has a forever word. It's truth. 
And this body of teaching does not die out with time. So don't let somebody say, well, that's just a 2,000-year-old document. As if to say, being old makes it untrue. No, being old makes it true. Especially since it has been revealed by God and the Holy Spirit confirming these words because God wanted these words to be permanent, stationary, and live and abide in every generation. No matter how many people change over time, the word of God is stationary. It's incorruptible. And it is preserved by the providence of God. See, it endures forever. Verse 25 goes on to say, the word of God endures forever. That's the truth. That's the word of God. It's the seed that will produce the new birth in the first century. And it will produce the new birth in the third and the fifth and the tenth and the fifteenth and in the twenty-first. Because it's the same word of God in every generation. That's what Peter believed. And that's what Peter would say right now. Another thing that you'll notice that Peter says and that he believed is that all teaching, if we're going to teach anything, Let's make sure that what we're teaching is the oracles of God. One of the things that is disturbing to me is I hear a lot of preachers these days seem to be coming up with a story to tell. And then they say, well, I wonder what scripture I can get to to fit with my story. I've got this story. I've just got to tell this story. And then they look and try to find a scripture to fit the story that they want to tell. Now, mind you, I'm not, I'm not against telling stories if your story is, is not primary. In other words, you can tell the truth of God's word and then you can illustrate it with a story or an illustration. But don't build the lesson and the teaching around some story you wanted to tell anyway, and then you go look for a scripture that maybe can fit in with that story. That's not a good approach at all. If any man speak, Peter says, let him speak as the oracles of God. There's what God commissioned us to teach. And he doesn't want us to to fool around with it and disrespect it But he wants us to preach the whole counsel of it. Every bit of it. All who preach the word must preach all of it. Every bit of it. Preach the whole counsel of God. The oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 verse 11. If any man, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're going to speak in behalf of God, make sure it is The oracles of God. Another thing. Peter believed that the gospel is something that man must respect so much that he yields himself to it. That he obeys it. Look in 1 Peter again. This time chapter 1 verse 2. He's writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion. Verse 2, to the elect, that would be all Christians, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience. God didn't, God did not give his son to die for us so that we would say he did it all and there is nothing for us to do. He did it all that that relates to how we're going to be saved. But he did not do all the things God wants us to do. We are elected to be obedient. Not to live by some faith only kind of idea. 
but to live under the concept of obedience to the divine truth God revealed. Obedience, obeying, yielding ourselves, actually complying with it. That's obedience, complying with what it demands and what it says. In verse 22 again, you purified your souls in obeying the truth. And if you didn't obey the truth, you didn't purify your soul. You see, those two things are locked in together. You don't separate the truth of God and obedience. Obedience is to the truth of God, and that is yielding yourself to the Spirit of God. Chapter 4, verse 17, Peter believed this also. He says, the time has come. For judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? What will be the end of them? Eternal misery is what will be the end of them. You see, obedience is what the gospel teaches. That's also what Paul taught in the book of Romans. It's one of the Interesting books that a lot of Calvinists will take a part of it and try to, try to teach faith only. And yet the book talks about obedience of faith at the start of it and at the end of it. And right in the middle of it in chapter 6, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. You obeyed it to which you were delivered. Those obedient statements stand out and say, no, it is not by some kind of mental assent, and that's all that you have to worry about. We have to be people who are obedient, yielding to the word of God, and that's what Peter believed. Another thing, though, Peter did not believe that the gospel was full of fable and fiction. In fact, Peter believed in the, as we said in the first point, the absolute truth of it. But look in chapter 5 now, 1 Peter chapter 5, and look at verse 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. I was there. I saw the sufferings of Christ. I witnessed it. So the story of the gospel is based upon eyewitness testimony, not fable, not fiction but something that was actually seen and done in time place with eyes looking on. Peter was there. And so it wasn't based on anything that was made up in the mind of man. It it wasn't a fable that was passed along. You can't dismiss this eyewitness testimony and, and, uh, and just cast it behind your back and act like, The measure of truth is our own imagination and that we can just kind of ascribe to it fable and fiction. You can't just, you know, flippantly cast it in this category you call fable or fiction without some good reason to do so. And there is no good reason to do that. For the ones who are testifying here are men who were there who saw it and they gave their lives to tell it. And to write it. Look in 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 16. Peter said, verse 16. We, talking about we apostles. We did not follow cunningly devised fables. Something that man can make up and devise it. We didn't do that. We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw him. For he received from God the Father honor and glory 
when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, saying, quote, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven when we were with him in the holy mountain. Matthew chapter 17 describes that Mount of Transfiguration experience where that voice verified that God was with his son. We also, in addition to this eyewitness testimony, that is not something that was devised by imagination and fable. In addition to that, we also have the prophetic word that would get the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to Malachi. The prophetic word is made more sure so that we can understand by its development and the fulfillment in Jesus Christ that that word can't be dismissed as fable either. The Old Testament can't be just thrown out flippantly because it was verified in its fulfillments. It's made more sure which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. And in this dark world, we need some light. And what better source of light can you, can you have than this light, the light of God's word? It's a light that shines in a dark place until the dawn, day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So you're holding in your hand the revelation of prophets who were guided by the Holy Spirit. The gospel is factual. It's based on eyewitness testimony, and it is not associated with fable at all. And that's what Peter believed. But another thing, it talks about a real place, a real future. I mean, just as surely as it believes in the eyewitness testimony that it presents... It is a presentation of confidence that when we talk about heaven, we're not talking about imagination either. We're talking about reality. There is a real place. Look in 1 Peter again, chapter 1. And this time I would like you to notice with me verse 3. He says... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. The difference between a wish and a living hope is a wish is not confident. It has no basis in confidence. It is just a wish. But hope is confidence, and it's based upon something that is confidently based. We have a hope that lives in us, a living hope, but how did we get it? We got it through the, the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Jesus' resurrection was factual. Eyewitnesses saw him alive again from the dead. And on that basis of the empty tomb, the missing body, and the eyewitnesses willing to die to tell their testimony that they had seen him alive, and that verified by the prophecies of the Old Testament as well. All of that converges together to tell us when I believe in heaven, when I believe that there is such a place as heaven, 
where I believe there is a God who sent his son here from heaven and his son went, uh, walked on this earth and then he left this earth and went back to heaven, that that's based upon eyewitness testimony that was very, very strong in its time and it has lost none of its strength even now. You see, he goes on to say that this living hope is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, but this living hope is to an inheritance that is incorruptible. This inheritance that is going to be ours is undefiled and that does not fade away and it is reserved for you. It is reserved in heaven for you. You see, we believe in the reality of heaven. And we believe that there is an inheritance reserved for us in heaven. And it is not just wishful thinking. It is based upon confident expectation that there is a reality of future rewards because of the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice also in chapter 5, verse 4. There he speaks again that when the chief shepherd appears, there is a reality. The chief shepherd was here. The chief shepherd went back to heaven. The chief shepherd is going to appear again. He said he would. When the chief shepherd appears... You will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. He's going to appear. And the crown of glory that does not fade away is going to be given to us if we're faithful to him. But then notice also in chapter 3 of 2 Peter. In the reading a moment ago. Peter talked about the fact that there will be those who are scoffing, who are acting like it's not real, that his coming is not going to take place. And if it did, where is it? And, and so they'll be scoffing and acting like it's not true. But Peter goes on to say, well, they're just ignorant. They're ignorant. People were scoffing in the days of Noah, but the flood took them away. And then he says this, verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We look for it. We anticipate it because it is just as real as the first coming. Of Jesus Christ. In verse 10, he says, The day of the Lord will come, but it's going to catch some people off guard, like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are therein will be burned up, and therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements melt with fervent heat, seeing that these things will take place? What manner of person ought you to be, unless you do not believe in the realities of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter believed in those realities. Another thing though, Peter did not believe that you can ever stay the same. That you don't just obey the gospel, you don't just get baptized and then you just kind of dismiss everything for a while and, and maybe every now and then uh, pay attention to some Bible class. But what he said was, that he believed in the necessity 
of spiritual growth that you take in the word of God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 in verse 2. If you have tasted the word of God, verse 3 says, if you've tasted that the Lord is good, then verse go back to verse 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. What he's saying is you desire it. You must desire it. As a newborn babe craves and says, I, I want food. I mean, they don't say it with their words, but they say it with their crying and screaming, don't they? They get your attention that they want more food. They want more milk. And they'll let you know it. And what he says to the newborn Christian is that you don't just get baptized, become born again, and then stay the same. But what you do is you crave the Word of God so that you're reading your Bible. You're listening to your Bible class teachers. You're listening to your parents as they tell you the things that are there. You listen to those who are preaching the word and you listen to it respectfully. Like a newborn babe, desire the milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That's the means by which you will grow spiritually. And then in 2 Peter chapter 1, he talks about the fact that God by his great divine power has given everything that pertains to life. That's 2 Peter 1 verse 2. In verse 3, as his divine power has given all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, that is through the knowledge of Jesus, who called us by glory and virtue, by which you have been given exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these, these great and precious promises, through these you may have, be partakers of the divine nature, that is, you become more like God, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, add to it. I mean, you've got faith that motivated you to be baptized. Well, keep adding, keep growing. Add to your faith virtue, which is moral excellence and moral courage. Courage to stand up for what you want, what you know is right. And then add to that courage knowledge and self-control. And self-control add perseverance, that is stick to itiveness, that you can stick to it. And persevere, hang tough. And add to that godliness and brotherly kindness and Add to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you don't want to be baptized and then there's no fruit producing. You don't want to be barren. God, look at this tree. Well, it, it sprang up when, it was, when the, this person was baptized. They sprang up. But then he comes back and looks at the tree and there's no fruit on it. You see, you were born again in order to grow and develop these qualities. And he who lacks these things, he says, is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. I mean, what, what good was it to be purged from your old sins if you're not going to grow and develop. What it does is it blinds you. And this blindness takes over. And we even forget that we were purged from our old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is a necessity, Peter believed, in spiritual growth. Otherwise, we die. One last thing. 
Peter believed in local church involvement. In other words, you do not separate, you do not become kind of a floating, disattached Christian. In the last several years, I've heard of people who are against all kinds. I mean, any kind of what they call institutionalized religion, that is, where you have to go to church. That's their concept. Now, there is an institutionalized religion that we are not to be a part of, but that's not the local church. In this case, I'd like you to just follow very closely through this line of argument here. In chapter 2 of 1 Peter, he says, love the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. Well, you've got to have some concept of who the brotherhood is. And then you've got to love the brotherhood. So there has got to be a developing of a, of a camaraderie, a fellowship, a, a kinship. Something that pulls us together. That we look at each other as kin to one another. And we love those who are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And we love them. But in chapter 3, look at chapter 3, verse 8. He says, finally, all of you be of one mind. All of you that he's writing to be of one mind. How are you going to know? Well, you know you're thinking alike, that you're valuing the same things. The same things are important to one is important to the other one. And all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. That's a unity. Compassion for one another. Who's he writing to? He's writing to people who understood there is a one another association. Chapter 4, verse 8. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Who is this one another? Well, it's got to be somebody that you can identify with. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another. Well, who is this one another? Well, this is obviously the local church. We are to be a part of one another, showing hospitality to one another, loving as brothers, being hospitable, ministering to one another, verse 10. As each one is received to give, minister it to one another. Look in chapter 5, verse 1. The elders who are among you. There is organization here. There are those who are designated as elders and they are among you. And as those elders are among you, there is also under that leadership a one another group. And you'll notice also that he says to these shepherds that they are to serve as overseers, not by constraint, but, by, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over the, those entrusted to you. Who is the ones entrusted to the elders? Well, it's a recognizable flock. It's not people all over the world, but it's a recognizable flock. And they are overseeing this local band of disciples, this local flock. Now, I want you to notice also, 
in verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, he will receive, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. That is, these elders are going to be rewarded. The chief shepherd is going to see to it. And then he comes back in verse 5 again to say, Younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, all of you in this flock are to be submissive to one another and to be clothed with humility because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. There is a flock. There is submissiveness to one another. And Peter did not believe in floating Christians. That Christians just float around and I'll visit this place this week and, and just never lock in to a one another relationship under the oversight of an eldership. And so it is important for us to recognize then that Peter believed in local church involvement. So much so that you loved your brothers. You knew who your family is. You knew who you're responsible for, to. You know who you're supposed to be hospitable toward. Who you're supposed to love. These, among other things, show us what Peter believed. And what he believed then is what he would believe now. And what we must believe now. Do you have the same faith as Peter? That you believe in all of those things just like Peter did, then you are one with the apostles who were one with Jesus, who was one with the Father. But if there's a disconnect somewhere where we do not believe the same thing that Peter believed, then we do not believe in the same Jesus that Peter believed and the same God that Jesus served and gave himself for us in behalf of the Father. You see, it all locks in together. And you can't just randomly throw anything out. Everything locks together. In this one faith. The truth of the gospel. I hope this evening that you appreciate having the same faith that Peter had. And that in spite of the way the world looks at it. You know the truth. And you'll spread that truth not only in yourself, but in others as well. Can we help you in your obedience to the gospel in any way tonight? If you're ready and we can help you, please don't harden your heart. Come now. Let your wishes be made known as we stand together and sing this song.